Uh, good afternoon and welcome all to Diplomatically Speaking, a foreign policy research center initiative of video interviews. I am Smriti Jain, an intern at Foreign Policy Research Center. I recently completed my master's in national security studies from Central University of Jammu. Today, we have with us Ambassador Anil Tugunayat. He's a member of the Indian Foreign Services. He has served in the Indian commissions in Bangladesh, Mongolia, USA, Russia, Sweden, and Nigeria, Libya, and Jordan. In the Ministry of External Affairs, he has worked in the economic, West Asia and North Africa, and consular divisions. He has also served as Director General Joint Secretary for the Gulf and Hajj divisions in the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi. Thereafter, Mr. Trigunayat worked as Deputy Chief of Mission in rank of ambassador in the Embassy of India, Moscow. Prior to his superannuation in May 2016, he served as ambassador of India to Jordan and Libya and High Commissioner to Malta. He is a postgraduate in physics from the Agra Kumanao University and also studied Russian history, culture, and language at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. As a visiting fellow, he also conducted research work at WTO and regional trading blocks at Oxford University. Presently, he is the president of Chamber of Commerce and TEDx, Secretary Association of Indian Diplomats, former ambassador, distinguished fellow of the Vekananda International Foundation, member of Governing Council, Racina House and USA NAS Foundation, advisor at Asia Africa Chamber of Commerce, BRICS Chamber of Commerce. He is a member of Oxford and Cambridge Society of India. He is also the honorary member of International Trade Council, Brussels. Now I hand over the floor to Professor Mahindra Gaur, Director of Foreign Policy Research Center, New Delhi. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, let me welcome uh, Ambassador Anil Tugnaiji. Uh, we are talking face to face uh, after a long time and can't see Zoom. And uh, uh, this is the only alternative available uh, now. So, sir, uh, let us begin the proceedings. And uh, as you know, uh, diplomatically speaking, uh, initiative of FPRC focuses on understanding India's foreign policy and relations. Uh, with the cooperation of uh, policymakers, diplomats, media persons, academics, and we hope to get uh, uh, certain issues analyzed, explained. In fact, there's a need to educate the people, particularly the young generation, about India's foreign policy and relations. They do not know the intricacies of diplomacy, how decisions are uh, arrived at, and uh, they just uh, start writing on social media. So I think uh, uh, our uh, objective is just to uh, explain things and that could be possible only through uh, diplomats and uh, others like you. So sir, uh, you. once again, I thank you. I know you are a 24 by seven. I mean, you had a distinguished career in the foreign service and uh, you have been a prolific writer, a speaker uh, and what not. And uh, so uh, I expect uh, something uh, very, very uh, in-depth uh, analysis uh, of a region, uh, which is in news uh, these days. After uh, Look East and uh, Central Asia, we are focusing on India and West Asia. So, sir, I begin my questions and uh, Thank you. they are like this. Number one, how this uh, extended Western neighborhood, West Asia, is important to us. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to you, Professor Gore, uh, and compliment you for uh, continuing to focus uh, consistently uh, on the various uh, foreign policy issues. And our association has been amazing uh, and very insightful for me as well uh, when I listen to, and I'm very happy I'm grateful that you have uh, invited me to talk about West Asia, uh, essentially, and I must thank Kismati for uh, that introduction. Uh, you know, the thing is that as far as West Asia is concerned, 
very often we call it as our extended neighborhood. Now, in my view personally, uh, very often I consider, and I think when we weigh it on many issues, I find that West Asia is possibly more important for us uh, strategically than even our own closer neighborhood, uh, with which we invest a great deal of our effort, time, and energy. But we have, for some reasons, uh, have not been that engaged uh, for many decades uh, with the region. So why it is important? It is important for our own security in the first place. Now, how do we call it our security? Security, number one, is the energy security, which means we're importing about 70 uh, to 75 percent of our petroleum and oil crude requirements from there. We are importing about 90 percent of our gas requirement from the region. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of food security, it is very important because for many countries like Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Mauritania, we are importing a lot of uh, fertilizers from these countries. And therefore, in our food security, they play an extremely important role. Thirdly, the maritime security, which is also very important because most of the uh, trade and whether it's oil and gas or others flows through that Babel Mandav mm -hmm. and St. Hermos and others, these choke chains. So it's very important that they are secured. And that from, from the perspective of uh, uh, anti-piracy and others also, it's extremely important for us. So why we feel, and the, one of the most important dimensions of this relationship is the presence of nearly 9 million Indian diaspora there who have been instrumental in the development of the Middle East per se, I would say, and also of India in the sense that they are providing nearly about 50 to $60 billion a year uh, to India's foreign exchange kitty, which is nearly about, I would say, one-tenth of our uh, overall foreign exchange that India possesses as of date today. So in certain times, that was much more crucial. And this is one community which is not only liked by the locals, but they preferred over anybody else. And they think that the Indians are very good uh, workers and they contribute a great deal in a very peaceful manner. So anything in that situation, you can imagine, if there is a problem in the region, if there is any conflict happens there, that has a direct bearing on our own uh, well-being, whether it is by way of evacuation of the Indian citizens, like you have seen during the pandemic, we had to uh, evacuate a very large number of Indians because all these countries have also been going through uh, an economic downturn uh, and uh, low oil prices and uh, low demand. So that is why it was very important. Then whenever there are conflicts, they have a, a direct bearing on our own interests. And therefore, it is important that India works towards the stability of this region and its security while ensuring its own national interests. So today it is very important and we see most of the major conflicts are happening or are likely to happen in the region. Uh, thank you, General. I think uh, that has given me a clue. Yes. What should I uh, expect from you uh, in the forthcoming questions? And uh, one thing uh, I would like you to just to explain, uh, till 2014, uh, our policy towards uh, uh, this uh, area was, uh, you know, given the name of uh, local West policy. I mean, uh, and then in 2014, uh, it was renamed uh, Link and uh, uh, Act uh, West policy. So, is there any symbolic? Uh, Significant to this, or some additional, uh, you can say, emphasis uh, was uh, uh, given uh, in our relationship with this area? No, it's a very good question, and I can tell you two things, uh, Professor Gore. When uh, I was Joint Secretary Gulf and Hajj in the Ministry of External Affairs uh, during 2008, uh, at that time when I arrived, I found that we have had no high level visits from India after Mrs. Indira Gandhi, and that you can imagine. Uh, uh, and this is a country I have already outlined the major important uh, uh, dependencies on this region for us. 
what we were doing basically is we were just buying and selling uh, buying oil and uh, using the transit points of dubai and elsewhere for trading purposes so it was a routine kind of a relationship and i remember in 2013 we had an internal meeting when i was ambassador in libya and i we had come it was an internal meeting and there was a discussion we were still looking at what to do what to talk about policy when we talk of west means it was the real west they they were west as generally understood not as the west asia so you start thinking what do we call it as a policy because it has like look east was a policy then it became act east and like that so somebody said this let's say look east then somebody said let's look at it link west and then eventually we call it act west but still some many people refer to it as link west now in all these the whole purpose of this is that it is to identify that there are indeed uh, very important and significant parameters and markers uh, which need to be worked upon in our relationship so as you know that the um, it was only in 2008 when i pushed for it then we had the visit of prime minister manmohan mm-hmm. singh uh, to uh, for after a very long time his visit to oman and qatar took place and then his visit to saudi arabia that completely changed the complex uh, of the relationship because very often as you know that uh, we did not have close relationship because in delhi there was a perspective possibly that these countries were very close to pakistan yeah. and therefore it could be a sort of a zero sum game kind of a thing that existed in delhi i said we need to win them away from that kind of an approach and we t- we went out and this for the first time in the riyadh declaration saudi arabia agreed to address the issue of uh, terrorism or collaboration and counter terrorism and that's what uh, really gave a frantic signs to our pakistani friends and then their foreign minister rushed to riyadh immediately after our visit and thereafter when prime minister modi came he has in my view really changed the whole gamut of it now the focus is because the world is changing the these countries themselves are moving uh, in their accordings in accordance with the the impact of the arab spring and the expectations of their people as well as the global changes that are taking place so they are all moving towards non fossil fuel economies or lesser dependence on these because these are fungible resources and thereafter uh, they are moving into renewables and to artificial intelligence and to technology driven to space driven so those are the kind of dimensions now that are taking place in the major economies and the gcc countries have also become far more ambitious in the our aim and objective i mean you can imagine at one time it was impossible to get uh, any offender who went and ran away or lived in dubai or elsewhere in in saudi arabia wherever you could have not have got them back i mean we know the case now but in the recent past what we have seen as our relationship has become far more strategic and i would say a great credit must go to uh, for this to prime minister modi because he has been uh, traveling to these countries you see when he came to par what happened is that everybody thought he's a rightist um, and a conservative prime minister so he will be more much more closer to towards israel at the expense of arab world but fortunately uh, good sense prevailed and prime minister modi had his first visit to uae he has been there three times so i believe that this is something that he has been uh, doing he has been to saudi arabia twice he may be invited he's been invited again to go for the green summit Uh, he'll be going there we have been helping them in g20 uh, the cyber security the intelligence cooperation the defense cooperation and uh, counter terrorism cooperation is something that has uh, really changed uh, our uh, relationship as you know that during the pulwama attacks and uh, during the article 370 and uh, also uh, invitation to india uh, for former foreign minister to come and address the oic uh, foreign ministers meeting was exceptional these things could not have imagined earlier and could not have happened before but today we are seeing all these happening on the ground so what we are seeing apart from their investments which they have committed a great deal into india in the strategic sectors i mean you can imagine for the first time uh, in the history of our relationship uh, the uae has agreed to allow indian companies to have 10% uh, stakes in an oil field that was unthinkable that did not happen now these are looking for indian investments so what we are looking at is their investments into india strategic oil reserves and tri country part- partnership so i think there is a qualitative change in our relationship that has come about 
uh, you very well explained uh, the issues involved, and uh, I take it further. Uh, there are few issues uh, in our relationship with West Asian countries. Uh, the number one is the energy dynamic has a certain impact on India and uh, supply of uh, oil. Uh, I mean, they have been, you know, fluctuating for shoes. It appears that uh, some outside powers also uh, try to uh, pressure India uh, by, I mean, directing that not to buy oil from a certain country or to uh, yes. just uh, push India to buy somewhere else. So how, I mean, this uh, pressure can be uh, resisted by India. What India should do under this pressure? Yeah, it is not the first time it has happened. We have seen that in 1973 and all when these countries, you know, there was this war, Iraq, uh, the Israel and Palestinian or the Arab-Israeli war. At that time, first time, these countries had started playing their, uh, I would say, the oil card uh, with the with the world. And in India also suffered a great deal. Second time in 1991, when this, uh, again, we had the, the, the Iraq war. And at that time, you remember that we, had, we were forced to really pawn our uh, gold in the UK. And uh, the problem was with the oil prices going up and all that. So India, since then, has been working on these long-term partnerships and collaborative relationship. Let us not forget one thing. If they are the producers, uh, we are the consumers. So without the consumers, the producers really can't do very much. They have to sell their oil. Maybe the cost may be high, but at, the, at, at some time they have to eventually uh, sell it to uh, India and China and, and Japan and Korea. They are the major uh, buyers of the Middle East oil today. But what happens is that when there is a problem with the countries like US, I mean, until recently, US was also dependent on the West Asian oil, but it has stopped now. It has by itself become a very major oil power. And not only it is, and also the hyper superpower. So not only that, but when it has a foreign policy objective in a country like Iran, from where we are buying 11 to 12% of our oil we were buying, and it tells you that we, if you buy oil, then your companies will be uh, imposed with sanctions because they want to... Um, uh, you know, fix Iran for some reason, and they have their problems uh, with them uh, in a larger foreign policy perspective. So India as a country finds it very, very difficult to do. Not only India, uh, most countries do that. But I feel that, you know, when we talk of our strategic autonomy, which is, of course, means that we have to serve our national interests first. Now, if our national interest in this sense uh, is served by simply discontinuing uh, our uh, relationship with a country for whom it is extremely important because for them, China and India are the two major markets for the Iranian oil. So therefore, if they are not happy with us, that is normal. We can understand that. But at the same time, what should India do in this situation? Number one is, you know, that when um, the USA was trying to, during Trump's time, was trying to impose these maximum pressure tactics and more sanctions and sanctions. So firstly, we got some waivers from the US. They gave us during Obama's time and even during Trump's time. But then they wanted to pressure uh, Iran to come back to the nuclear table with new demands and all that. Iran did not give in. It's a long civilizational country. It has its own, uh, I think, capacity to withstand the pressure and which has done for decades now. The thing is that in India, I believe that what we should have done is, in my view, that we completely shutting down our uh, approaches uh, has a long-term impact because India is not like another small country. It is a very large country, large economy, uh, uh, seen as a regional power, seen as a power which plays a global role. And therefore, when these kind of expectations in the Middle East and anywhere else are from us, we need to rise to that occasion. We cannot be wilting under pressure from whether it's a Russia or a China or a, uh, or, or a USA. So we have to really, in my view, develop some kind of... Uh, uh, special purpose vehicle, certain companies that can actually withstand and they can be out of the purview of the, the international sanction or unilateral sanctions. I would say not the UN sanctions, we have to honor them. But when unilateral sanctions by certain countries are imposed, we should have those kind of vehicles. And those vehicles can be companies in the PPP model. There can be the, and you can have India, Rupi Rial trade, you can have barter trade, you can have different kind of banking systems. Um, you know, so those are the things that need to be done, but we must have an alternative available. It will not be the full-fledged uh, trade relationship the same way, but that way you can show your 
uh, strategic autonomy and that convey. Because see, what is the friend? When we say the US is our greatest uh, strategic partner or Iran is our strategic partner, they need to consider our critical and crucial interests as well. They cannot just say that, okay, this is my foreign policy objective, you have to fall in line. Now that does not speak very well of this. So I think that today you know that we need Iran for Afghanistan, what is happening there. So things change and therefore it is important that from a longer term perspective, we must think from that. And our relationship with individually with all countries, I would say in the region are is excellent. And this is really a, a, a very good achievement, I would say. Yes, uh, I quite agree with uh, what you have said. Uh, there was more issue uh, relating to our relations with West Asia. It is about the, the presence of a, a huge Indian diaspora in these countries. And uh, often uh, it is uh, uh, said that uh, the host countries do not take uh, sufficient steps, do not take care of Indian diaspora about their welfare and all that. So what most should we expect these countries to look after Indian diaspora uh, in those uh, particular countries? Yeah, you are right. I mean, there are many cases uh, in nearly every country where we have these labor disputes. So what we have been doing, we have been having some kind of agreements and MOUs uh, with the, each country, uh, where which is uh, the labor MOUs, basically how the labor will be treated in case of a problem or dispute, how uh, they will be moved out, um, then what kind of assistance can be provided to them. You see, in most of these Arab countries uh, or, or the Middle East, uh, the law legal system uh, is somewhat facile. So I would say that uh, it mostly depends on the goodwill of the uh, ABC government. Now, we have been signing these agreements uh, with all of them. Despite that, there are certain cases. Now, that happens because of many reasons. That happens because in India, you have some unscrupulous agents. Uh, they sign a different agreement with the, uh, with, with the employer. And uh, then when you arrive there, then the labor is poorly fellow given different job or a different amount of money or working conditions are not good. But those cases are few and far between. They are not far too many cases. But in, if you say 9 million, and even if there are 100,000 cases, they are too much. Then our embassies also maintain various shelter houses, especially for women who are going. Then we have increased the, the age of women, 35 years plus, who can be employed as maids or uh, you know, or the the uh, or nurses or whatever it is. So that is something that India has tried to do. That uh, we need to skill our people. One more thing that is going to be important is that you know when you go to the Middle East, you will see that there are Filipinos and then there are Indians and which a maximum number of people. And then you have Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans, and all. So there is a qualitative difference. They are educated. Uh, they are able to uh, you know talk about their issues. So our embassies today, as you know, especially I would say uh, during the, the, started with the former foreign minister Sushma Swaraj's time, she started taking a lot of personal interest. Indian government had also started a, a separate ministry of overseas Indian affairs. I have myself participated in many of these agreements. I mean, when I was in Jordan, what we did was we tried to create an institutional mechanism, uh, the king's uh, office itself. So he designated a director in case your people have any problem, please directly connect with him and we will solve this. Now, these are interpersonal issues also because sometimes people don't understand what they're going there for. But as an Indian embassy or an ambassador, this is the responsibility, our responsibility to get the best deal for our people and to keep them out of trouble. It is a very difficult, challenging task. Most of our ambassadors are actually busy with most of the community work, I must say. And they have these open houses. They keep on connecting with them. We have consular camps. So a lot of things are there, but we also intervene with the authorities to alleviate any suffering of any person there is. So I think it is a constant 24 seven kind of a job. And that is why all embassies in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf region, have these 24 seven helplines available to our people. And they are responded to very quickly. Uh, yes, uh, uh, nothing to disagree with that. And uh, more of us are needed uh, on the part of India as well as uh, the West Asian country. This takes me to another concern, uh, which is often raised in India, that uh, our legitimate uh, concerns about the shelter of terrorists, economic offenders, fugitives, is not uh, taken care of 
by uh, i won't say that all but in some cases uh, the attention is not paid uh, as it should be and uh, that raises you know sometimes uh, acrimony uh, between india and this country we feel that uh, uh, such element should be handed over uh, and legal procedure and whatever other mechanisms are available i think they should be utilized and uh, this is something which india has always been pressing and uh, asking these western countries that uh, our legitimate concern should be addressed by them yes no you are absolutely right i mean this has been one of the major concerns uh, i would say until 2014 15 uh, these countries were not very uh, forthcoming uh, in handing over or sending these offenders and most lot of them offenders go to dubai or to riyadh or somewhere now they, it was very difficult uh, to get them back but i must say that in the past 3 4 years we have seen uh, a very Uh, I, i would say a drastic change in their attitude they have understood the value of india and uh, the india is a destination and so they are also equally keen to honor our concerns so i have seen it that in the past we have seen you know um, in that helicopter scam case uh, the person was immediately sent to india there was another so there i, I have seen in the past about 3 4 years at least a dozen major offenders have been returned to india now that is uh, why true we have to it's a long procedure we have extradition treaties with them uh, we have strategic partnerships with them we have mutual legal assistance treaties with these countries and i must say that now i see a a, a great change in their attitude uh, towards these things and they are more than forthcoming because they think that these people are an unnecessary irritant in a relationship so i find it much more of course we have to be vigilant about it i remember many in 2008 when we tried to get some people we had the information and then with the connivance of the local authorities those people were not there when the police went to raid them so that was they were passed given a tip we have seen i mean i hope the only other irritant that is today remaining uh, is that of daud of course the ua says he does not live here he, he has a house in karachi or wherever so that is the only major uh, person that we think that uh, we are uh, able to handle that so i am quite sure that things are moving uh forward in the right direction at this stage yes uh, i think much more is to be done on both sides and uh, now i take it uh to one of the uh major issues uh between india and west asia we get a lot of foreign investment from all parts of the world and west asia we can get uh, abundant uh investment the need on india's part is how to tap it how to get the maximum foreign investment from west asian countries because they are rich and uh, they can help us uh, in you know taking our economy further and that the target of you know that uh, uh, economy that we expect uh, to 2030 so uh, what india should do to tap this uh, uh, source of uh, foreign investment from this area yeah you know this is the this has been a major problem in the past and even today it continues you see what happens is that they have as you know that saudi arabia has uh, agreed to invest about 100 billion dollars in india and uae has agreed to invest about 75 billion dollars in india uh, they, there is a refinery uh, in ratnagiri which is uh, with the investment of about 40 billion dollars that is going to be uh, it's a it's a uae saudi initiative uh, even during the pandemic i would like to say that um, the saudis and the uae emiratis they have both invested significantly in the reliance group uh, in the technology sector so moreover the whether it is qatari funds or their sovereign wealth funds from these countries they have been looking for opportunities or in, and investing earlier they wanted to invest in the in the agricultural field or like the big contract farming and now they are looking at the investing in the strategic reserves they are investing in the housing sector in the hospitality sector so the thing is that you know every country has uh, its own preference of the bouquet of uh, areas in which it would like to invest but today they are already looking at investment in a big way in india and they are also expecting huge investments into their own economy 
Now, because even if they have huge sovereign wealth funds, and as I mentioned, because of the uncertain oil scenario or the revenue streams, many of these countries are facing budget deficit, deficit themselves. They have to draw uh, money from their uh, sovereign wealth funds. For example, in, it happened in Kuwait, Oman is having a stressed economy at the moment. So other economies are also in the same way. Uh, there are larger economies like Saudi Arabia. They are going in a huge construction. So the Indian companies can get those construction projects. They can participate in those big construction projects that brings you enough money. So it has to be a two-way street, I think. And uh, I'm quite sure, I mean, if you come to think of it, we have about 5,000 uh, uh, Indian companies which are operating out of UAE from the special economic zones. Large number of them are in Saudi Arabia. We need to do more at home as far as our policy framework is concerned, as far as making right kind of opportunities for them is concerned. But that applies to the whole world from where we are trying to look for investment. And of course, India has made certain reforms, and uh, I am quite sure the economic reforms is not an end in itself. It is a continuing process, and we have to continue to do that. Then only you see 70 countries are looking for foreign investments across the world all the time, and each one tries to do better. Now, when we say that we are 53rd rank, we have improved by 10 or 20 ranks, it means 52 countries have better policy frameworks than you have. So we need to work on that. That's important. That's how the, because capital flows accordingly. It does not flow out of friendship. It does not flow out of uh, Yari Dosti. Uh, uh, policy uh, orientation changes at the policy level, even at the administrative level, are required uh, to attract uh, investment, not only from West Asia, from all parts of the world. Yes. Uh, this has been something uh, very, uh, you know, challenging because uh, foreign, I mean, the foreign investment is available, but uh, they just uh, hesitate uh, because of certain you know, difficulties, the problem that they face. Uh, of course, there's a single window clearance now and uh, all these uh, matters are taken up directly at the PMO level and all that. But when they go to the states, I mean, they face a little difficulty acquiring land, electricity, water connection. I mean, uh, these are practical difficulties that uh, foreign investors feel, and they want to be assured that uh, once we invest, uh, I mean, uh, our concerns should be taken care of. Our central government is doing all right, but uh, yeah. much is to be done by the state level. In fact, I remember that when I was in New York at a seminar, I was speaking, and I mentioned about we have a single window clearance. So one of the Americans stood up and he said, can you please tell us how many windows behind that window? <laughs> so, I mean, that has been a reality. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, that we have come a long way, but it's still, I guess, a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am reminded of a seminar at RIS where a Korean delegation had come. And they were all, you know, have their grievances uh, about the single window killers and all that. One retired, you know, IS, very senior IS officer who was uh, connected with RIS. He just said, appoint a committee with the chief minister of the concerned state and all your problems will be solved. I mean, that was a practical solution looking to Indian condition and all that. Anyway, uh, these are the lighter moments of you know, diplomacy and all that. Uh, now, uh, I would like to take up uh, one or two issues more. Uh, yeah. One is about, uh, which has been of very you know, consistent concern in India, particularly in uh, domestic politics. Uh, our relationship with uh, Israel and uh, Palestine. There is, a, I mean, a sort of you know, a complaint. Uh, I mean, uh, some voices have come up that after 2014, we are getting closer to Israel. We are neglecting Palestine and the support uh, to Palestine is not uh, up to that extent or up to that level. And we are diluting our support and sympathy for Palestine. Uh, do you agree with this viewpoint? No, I, I totally disagree with this, uh, uh, this kind of a statement or an impression for the simple reason that what is our policy? Our policy is we stand for a two-state solution in accordance with whatever has been agreed between uh, Palestine, Israel, and the Quartet and everybody else over the years in accordance with the UN Security Council resolution. So there is no change in India's policy as far as that is concerned. Uh, you know that recently when there was the Israel-Hamas war, 
uh, we had seen that India is the one, because we were in the UN, UN Security Council this time, the, our statement was very clear. It did not approve the, uh, the, the escalation of violence by the Gaza or by Hamas. At the same time, did not approve of what was being done by the, uh, by, by the Israeli side, disproportionate. And we asked them that, okay, this uh, solution should be repeated. There should be a dialogue between two, ceasefire and all. So precisely what India has been doing all along, like Mahatma Gandhi, when he said that uh, Palestine is for the Palestinians as, the, as England for the British or the France for the French. So we have always followed that kind of a policy. We have stood with them. Now, why people say it? Because see, sometimes uh, we do not exactly replicate uh, the same verbatim words uh, that, uh, that that is being said by people that uh, it should be East Jerusalem should be the capital, 1967 borders, and this is the longish kind of a statement. Now, much water has flown down. Everybody knows it. But where is the change in India's policy? As I mentioned in the beginning, that the Arab world was basically concerned that India will probably leave its uh, Palestinian cause attachment to that or support for that and uh, be less uh, sanguine about the Arab state. But that has not proved. Actually, uh, the con on the contrary, our relationship with the Arab world has really qual seen a qualitative change under this government. That I would say. And we must grant, and I'm not speaking for the government at all, but this is as an objective analyst, I can tell you this is a fact. On the other hand, what have we done? We have said that our relationship with, with Israel and Palestine will stand on its own. That means we call it as a dehyphenation of the relationship, Israel-Palestine. Means Prime Minister Modi, when he goes to Israel, he goes to Israel, he does the business there, and he comes back. Then he goes to Palestine separately. He becomes the first Prime Minister to visit Palestine, first Prime Minister to visit Israel. And all the Arab countries, you would be surprised, all the wherever he has gone, he has been honored with the highest honor of those countries, which shows the confidence in them, in India, India's policies. Of course, when now in the age of social media, when you see your oh, stand with Palestine, stand with Israel, those kind of handles that are going around, they create a lot of sensation. But that's not the fact. Even when, you know, on the Jerusalem, when Trump declared that he will be shifting his capital to Jerusalem, and when the discussions happened in uh, in uh, UNGA, India opposed it. And immediately after that, we had the visit of Netanyahu to India. And Netanyahu said, we understand one statement does not change the quality of relationship. So wherever it is necessary, uh, on a principled issue, we stand with them. We do not approve of their increasing uh, settlements, uh, or we always urge them to settle it somehow. But we don't have that kind of a have to uh, push either side. It is only the United States which can push both sides to come to the table and resolve the situation. Lastly, I would like to say we cannot be holier than the Pope. If the Palestinians are fighting among themselves, they cannot make up a one front. And when the, all the Arab countries are not standing with them the they used to at one time, I mean, how much can India do in that sense of the term? We are doing our bit bilaterally. We are looking after them. We are providing thousands of scholarships. We are giving them millions of dollars in assistance, whether for the refugees or otherwise. We are taking up their cause in the United Nations. Now, more than that, I, if they, I don't know what they expect from India. So there is no change in India's policy as far as either Palestine are concerned or Israel or the Arab world is concerned. Uh, you're right, uh, to a great extent. Uh, this takes me to another uh, major development that has taken place in the West Asia recently, that is uh, signing of Abraham Accord. It has a, you know, very very powerful impact on the regional politics and all. How India looks at it? Will it be able to restore peace, stability in the region? Well, as you know, that uh, the whole region, actually, the Middle East is really going through a political and economic churn, I would say. And if you put pandemic to it, so it adds to the third dimension of it, that is pandemic churn. So all these countries are also looking for a new kind of uh, a, a power game. Uh, if, you know, there are standard uh, issues between them, Israel, Saudi, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Iran, Iran, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Those fights and those historical problems are continuing with them countries at least since 1979 have become the same. 
Now they will continue, and that's where the Americans have played a little bit of a nasty role as far as Iran is concerned during Trump era. But they are trying to uh, review that. So what is happening is that all these countries they are looking for uh, better markets, better technology, and better uh, things for themselves. You know, to stand up, especially UAE and Saudi Arabia. These are the two major countries that are trying to do that. Trump, in the meantime, he was very much invested in that one sense of the term in the Middle East. He tried to. Create because see U.S. foreign policy the biggest uh, bait for them is that Israeli security is paramount for any U.S. foreign policy establishment. So they try to do anything that is possible. Now that can only come when there is a lesser tension between the Arab countries and the Israelis. So under the table, the Israelis and all the Gulf countries, everybody has been talking and working together, security and other dimensions that has been going on. They have two treaties, one with Egypt in 1979 and 1994 with Jordan. The peace treaties with two countries, but they have been virtually the cold peace, not really arrived. So Trump tried to find UAE, which is which actually sees itself some kind of a middle kingdom syndrome. So it wants to see itself as an advanced country. So it moved forward, and they normalized the relations officially with Israel. So did Bahrain, uh, at the in my view, at the behest of the Saudis. Saudis directly cannot do that because they are still the custodian of two holy mosques. They still are Arab League, and they are also in the OIC. So therefore, they control all these organizations. Therefore, for them, settlement of Palestinian cause is as important, at least for the old leadership. New one, we will not know how once uh, MBS becomes the the king, uh, then what will what shape Saudis will take. But that has not prevented them from collaborating with the Israelis. So we are seeing that this is go happening now. As far as India is concerned, India has welcomed this development because for us, Israel is our strategic partner. UAE is our uh, the, one of the biggest uh, and most strategic partners in the Middle East, uh, and therefore, from our perspective, the two partners are good friends. It makes our life easier. And then, secondly, now, in terms of technological uh, domain or in terms of investments into third countries, for example, in Africa, in the agriculture sector, we all can have a trilateral cooperation. We can have a trilateral cooperation and counter uh, insurgencies and the counter terrorism. So it adds new dimension of collaboration possibilities uh, among the three countries or other countries who have normalized the relations uh, with them. So we would like the peace to happen, but whether this will add to the peace, I don't think so. The reason being, you have other bigger players. Number one is China, which is a very big player now, in, um, and this will be your biggest trouble. Uh, for in the years to come in uh, Middle East, uh, as anywhere else, and South Asia too. So China is a very major. Russia is regaining via Syria, Libya, and all these places. Uh, it's regaining its position. America is seen to be uh, going little bit uh, in the background or going back from the active uh, role uh, in the region as a security provider. So new equations and Iran and uh, U.S. and Iran and Israel. Uh, is unlikely to improve uh, much, even if the U.S. return to the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Agreement action. So, what I'm looking at, I'm looking at is uh, China, uh, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, which is a new uh, boy on the block, uh, and Qatar on the outline. So, a cryptic, which I call it, a kind of an emerging and alternate uh, strategic equation. Uh, which is not formal, but which has every chance of uh, coming together uh, in the future. So, how the U.S. policies eventually will play out, and Biden administration and successive administration will decide whether the Abraham Accords will have any uh, positive impact uh, or it will have a balancing impact between these two groupings. Yeah, yeah. you have an interesting issue in the wider perspective, yeah. and. Uh, how the major powers are uh, going to react and uh, act and behave towards the Western nations. In the end, I would like to ask one more question, but it is very, you know, uh, very important from Indian domestic uh, political perspective. The role of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Does Pakistan impacts our relations with uh, West Asia? The religion card has it been, uh, I mean, played, and uh, has Pakistan been successful in doing so? 
Pakistan has been very successful for a very long time. Pakistan has survived, and not only because of this Middle East country, but because see, all these countries were also part of the US uh, security domain, whether it was seen CENTO, CETO, and all. So these countries were part of that. They were anti-Soviet uh, bloc uh, uh, in the beginning. So therefore, it was very important, whether it was Iran and Saudi Arabia until 1979 were on the same side of the story. So Pakistan was the only Islamic country which was trying to provide them this uh, facade of being a protector of Islam and uh, you know a country which has nuclear powers. So they depended on their uh, this paper tiger type of thing. So this is precisely why they were all invested heavily in in Pakistan, uh, whether it was to deal with Afghanistan or Taliban or whether to uh, require their forces, uh, Pakistani forces, to come and fight for their wars in the Arab world. So they were using Pakistan quite well and funding it also equally well. But over time, what has happened is they have also realized that it is not the same world as it used to be. U.S. policies have completely changed. The South, U.S. has started uh, having closer ties with Iran during Obama administration when they signed this treaty. So Saudi Arabia woke up and decided that it was getting difficult for us and they can't have an indefinite funding. Same way UAE and other countries started playing. Then Israel although not too happy about it. Then came Biden and then Trump, and Trump withdrew from the treaty. So again, these guys were started playing tricks. And then everybody realized that Pakistan is a bad boy. But we have seen that Saudi Arabia even, and why bad boy? Why bad boy in the sense is Pakistan has very close relations with Turkey. And Turkey has these ambitions, especially under the current president, Erdogan, to become Islamic leader. Now, there are three... I would say main Islamic leaders at the moment, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and uh, uh, to a smaller extent, it was Jordan, because they also are the custodian of the third holy mosque. Now, Turkey say, is back in the game in the Middle East, whether it is in Syria, Iraq, Libya, wherever. So, And Pakistan has been its very close ally for a very long time. And therefore, and Pakistan and Turkey together, they have been in, whether in, uh, in different uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, we have seen uh, how they are working together. So I think the Pakistan factor was very much there. More importantly, if you remember the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, uh, meeting in 1969 when India was invited, but had to go back uh, because Pakistan's General Yahya Khan said that he, would, he cannot go back and show his face in his country if India is admitted to the Organization of OIC countries. Like that is one of the largest organizations where Pakistan... Uh, it still continues to play the Kashmir card and the Islamic card and all that. I say that today it is no longer, as I mentioned earlier, that Balakot and Article 370, and we have seen in this, the countries who, who spoke against Iran and Turkey, they are the two countries in Malaysia, they are the countries who spoke against India in these things. Because there was a new kind of a Islamic group that Pakistan was trying to create with the help of these countries, and it annoyed Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others, and they cut their aid from uh, from Pakistanis, and then you know that how Imran Khan went running to Riyadh, Nangipair, as they say, uh, to to plead with them. So, so this is uh, the, this is now changing. They have understood that terrorism, which they at one time themselves used to support, <laughs> is not no longer going to take them any further. So the Pakistan is in the dock in that sense. But Pakistan has found new uh, benefactors in China. So China is supporting them. Actually, China even paid $1 billion to pay back to the Saudis uh, in, uh, when the Saudis stopped and wanted the money back. So we are seeing that Pakistan is on a receiving end from all sides. But if you think that the Pakistan as a factor has completely gone, no, that's not true. It's very much relevant there. The, in their politics, Pakistan has this. Uh, and I always say, I mean, I think we need to analyze it ourselves, that whatever you may say, we, we, we don't like them. We don't like their policy of terrorism, exporting terrorism or counter-terrorism as a foreign policy tool, but it, or to terrorism as a foreign policy tool. But what is important is that they have somehow, as I always say, is able to encash their nuisance value vis-a-vis -vis USA, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis China. So that is something they have been able to do and stay afloat. Uh, but from our perspective, we don't have to worry any more about that because we have already wasted too much time thinking that Pakistan is very strong. And I mentioned to you the 2008 visit of Dr. Manmohan Singh to, to, to Saudi Arabia, which was a game changer uh, from our perspective. 
So they know it that India is a big market. India is a vibrant market. India is a democracy. India is a benign country, and therefore they want to have greater closer relations with us in a strategic domain. And I think that change perspective has paid dividends to India. I mean, mm -hmm. I know India uh, can almost uh, not ignore, but uh, doesn't want to pay any uh, attention to what Pakistan is doing or what. Because we know you should not bother. You should not bother. About yeah, yeah. and um, we have been uh, having very good relations with the West Asian countries. Yes. To sum up, uh, I would like to uh, know from you, as you have, I think, mentioned somewhere, that in spite of challenges, our West Asia policy has been, uh, to a large extent, very successful. Uh, do you still stick to it? Yes, I've always said that of all the foreign policy achievements of Prime Minister Modi, I would say that West Asia policy is his great success in a bilateral domain. We have new challenges. And as you know, any relationship, you have to nurture it all the time and be sensitive to each other's concerns. That's very important. But if we have these kind of relations and if we want to become a bigger power and play a greater role, which what most of the West Asian countries expect India to play, uh, then I think we'll have to uh, go into a higher orbit of our uh, cooperation with these countries and try to uh, do something that they, they also look up to us as whether it is a security provider or as a, a trusted arbiter or a trusted mediator uh, or interlocutor uh, among their various problems between these countries. So which is something that I think we should look at very seriously uh, in the next decades. Uh, I think that is a widely accepted view in India also. and. Uh, uh, and then uh, I would like to request you to allow uh, our intern Ismriti to ask a question to you. Yes. This, yes. Is, this is an opportunity that we provide to our interns. And this is possible uh, only because of the Zoom. Previously, we used to video record everything and uh, our interns were not there. Uh, I used to have these interviews. But the Zoom has provided uh, this opportunity. And uh, why not uh, our interns? They are very brilliant. Very and I tell you, uh, I mean, uh, they are not only students from Indian universities, they are also students from foreign universities. They are mm -hmm. studying there. So really, we are very fortunate to have such a, a large number of interns. And uh, I pick up the best, and uh, one of them is here. And uh, she would like to ask a question. Sure. Yeah, it's my Thank you. Uh, sir, should India as a country be collaborating with major powers to establish peace in West Asia? Well, I have, as I have mentioned uh, just now, this is what I was referring to, that they expect uh, India to play a greater role. Mm -hmm. You cannot be sitting by the side on the bank and counting the waves, hoping that there'll be no tide. So if we consider that West Asia region is of great importance, significance, stability is most important for us, it is important for us to be thoroughly involved. I remember many times they have been asking that why doesn't India provide us uh, some participate in some kind of a security domain, right? We have not been very keen on this. Of course, today as we talk, we are having a Navy exercises with Saudi Arabia. So now we have started increasing our footprint and we will be asked to do that. Of course, by the ourselves, it will be difficult to do anything. As a, But big powers means the powers also have their own geopolitical game. Now, big powers, by we cannot work with China in the Middle East because China wishes to undermine your interests everywhere. Russia and China have their own dynamic and a problem. US and China, US and Russia, they have their own dynamic. So it could be counterproductive sometimes. I tell you, when Palestinians, you talk to them, they say, we don't trust the Americans. We don't trust anybody. But can India play a role? They are asking China to play a role. So we have to see what kind of a role can we play. I think a benign role, for example, having uh, some good uh, senior person uh, as our um, special representative, as we call them, and, you know, a Middle East representative, a special envoy and all. We should have them. I mean, for example, when a uh, Palestinian issue was a fight was going on, everybody was coming around. Uh, we could have sent one of the guys who could go and talk to them by cool down your tempers, man, just cool down. 
Now that that does not take much of it. Or if you have, we are as such do in bilaterals. When we discuss Iranian foreign minister, we meet him. We discuss the whole gamut of relationship. Now we take it separately. Now could we do it in a GCC so format or in the overall West Asia format? Syrians want us to help them. Now so wherever it is possible for us, not militarily, I would never advise that. But as a as a country that we are seen to be present when they have a trouble. Like for example, if there was a, a flood, a problem, or so something like that, we have become an emergency responder. So we should try to do that quickly, whether it is in Syria or whether it is in Iraq or it was in Lebanon or somewhere. We should be seen to be doing these things. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, yes, sir, that's all. Thank you. So, sir, uh, uh, we come to the end of this uh, uh, wonderful, you know, dialogue. And uh, I'm really thankful to you and uh, see you after a long time. And uh, really, it was a, a very, very, uh, you know, insightful, uh, you know, analysis of the issues that we face in West Asia. I know you have been uh, writing uh, a lot on West Asia. That's why in this you know series of uh, area studies uh, after East Asia, Central Asia, I thought of West Asia, and I couldn't think of, of anybody else except you uh, to you. I mean explain things and help us understand also the public at large and uh, particularly the young generation, the university students. They should try to understand the, these intricate issues involved uh, in the uh, making of foreign policy diplomatic endeavors and all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Smriti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.